Hi there, you are listening to the Guitar Speak podcast. My name is Matt Wakeling and this is the show that I produce in Sydney, Australia where I sit down and speak to leading guitarists and guitar figures from all around the world. Thank you so much for joining me. Now today I speak to Australian guitarist Jeremy Barnes who is known as a mind-bogglingly talented and incredible ferocious shredder kind of guy but also increasingly in recent years has become a um, very much wanted, sought after guitarist, songwriter, session musician in the Australian country music scene as well. We had a great conversation, so let's jump straight into it. Jeremy Barnes on the Guitar Speak podcast. Jeremy Barnes, welcome to the Guitar Speak podcast. Hey Matt, thank you for having me. It's been a long time coming. I'm glad we finally got around to it. Most yes. of it's been my slackness in, in never getting back to you with times, but <laughs> we're here. We are. We're here. here. And I joined in on that a lot too. So between us, it's taken it's taken a while. For um, our quick yes. backstory, we've we've kind of just worked out that we've probably not never met in person, but we've got lots of mutual friends and yes. we've, we've known of each other for a long time. Yes, absolutely. And so, it's nice to finally be talking to you. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. So it's been one of those scenarios, I think, where people go, hey, do you know Matt Wakeling? And I go, you know I do. And they go, oh, where did you meet him? Well, I've never met him, but I just know, I feel like I know him so well. Like, you know, I've just heard his name so many times there in my life. So. so it's good that we finally sort of made it into the same well, not room, but path. Yeah, yeah same phone. So, <laughs> same same phone line. Yeah, we. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have shared rooms because I've seen you play, but. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, but I, I never said hello because I was. Um, I don't know why. You were. Well, it was just probably your mind was probably boggled from all the nonsense. Yeah, it was um, the first time. Yes, yes, that was so. the Sydney. <laughs> that was the Sydney Guitar Show back in twenty. Wow. Twenty oh seven, I think. Yeah. So it was yeah, boggled. Yeah, it would have been. It was. Yeah, it would have been twenty oh seven. So yeah, because I didn't take a lot of breaks in my playing back. I don't, you know, I, I don't. Th- I probably bent bent a string twice in that show. <laughs> um, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've we've come a, a fair way since then. <laughs> and. The- the other time around then, it might have been before or after that, I can't remember, you were playing at a wedding, I think. Oh. You were singing and playing guitar. And I thought, he's not that fast. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Which was the joke because, you know, you're, you're doing a... Yeah, 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 yeah. You're doing so, a love song. Well, you're backing up a singer or something on an acoustic wow. guitar. Wow. Anyway. I don't even know where that would have been. Okay. Well, But we really should have hung out that night. Yeah, yeah. So, we're so we'll, sorry we didn't do that. We'll make up for all this. We, yes, we will. We've got lots of lots to catch up on. Nice. Hey, before the times that we could have met but we didn't, let's back mm-hmm. up a little. When did yep. you start playing guitar, Jeremy? Oh, I started playing guitar um, fairly late, actually. I was 15 mm-hmm. when I started playing guitar. And the funny story about that is that um, my, my dad used to leave guitars lying around the house and because uh, he's a guitarist, um, classical guitarist, mm-hmm. and he used to leave his guitars lying around the house in the hopes that we would pick them up and play them. Because my brother, my brother and I were sort of we were right into to sports, um, and not interested in guitar at all. So, but I, you know, at seven eight years old, you know, I would pick up his um, classical guitars and just work out television themes. Like oh, I remember wow. working out, yeah. So, <laughs> awesome. so I, I would just sit there, and I didn't. I thought that everybody could do this, you know, and I would I would work out. Um, tunes like the Jetsons, you know, and that had lots of real interesting chromatic notes in it. Oh, so yeah, I'd be, yeah. be sitting there just on the E string, just on the high E string, just going, ba, 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 da, you know, like all those um, Lydian sounding notes. And, yeah, yeah. And so so he could see that I had a, 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 an aptitude for it and a good ear, but, uh, you know, he asked, you know, he would say, oh, look, I'd like to teach you guitar. And I was just never interested. I just wanted to run around outside like a crazy person. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, he asked me, I think, over the years, uh, five times, would you like to learn guitar? Would you like to learn guitar? And I always said, no, I'm not interested. I'm doing cricket camp. I'm, you know, playing rugby league. I'm, uh, you know, I'm doing all of this stuff. And it was on the sixth time that he asked me. And I was, I was, you know, just about to turn 15. And uh, and I was like, ah, oh, you know, it might be okay um, for, for, for a rainy day. It might be something fun for me to do when I can't run around and play sports. So I went, ah, yeah, well, you know, whatever. 
um, you, you can teach me guitar. He ended up not teaching me a guitar. There was uh, there was a guy that had come home and and uh, from Sydney, and he was a guitar player. He said, "Well, I don't think you'll listen to me, so I'm going to get this guy. His name was Michael Peters. Um, he's going to come over for half an hour every Monday and and give you a guitar lesson." And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, cool, no worries. I just just to be just to shut you up, Dad. I'm going to do this." And just became addicted to it straight away. Literally after lesson one, wow. um, became addicted to it. And the, the guys, because I said to him, I said, what do I need? You know, how long till I'm a good guitar player? And he gave that frustrating answer. That we all <laughs> well, it depends how much you practice. Yes. He said, but yeah. just do half an hour a day. He said, if you just do half an hour a day, it'll make a massive difference to your playing. Yeah. And and I just started off like from, from lesson two when I could only play like a D and an A, I would play for an hour, hour and a half every day after school. Wow. Um, you know, and uh, and I and I had to like after the third lesson, he taught me um, – you know, just a normal C chord to a G chord, which I thought was the hardest thing that a human could possibly do with their <laughs> finger. I'm like, how am I supposed to get that first finger all the way over? You know, so so yeah. I would sit oh, there sure. and um and um <laughs> just sit just sit there in front of the television and just play C and G over and over again uh, until I got it. So I had that level of obsession really early. It okay. was quite strange. So <laughs> so yeah, th- thirty two years now. Um, yeah. I tend to talk a lot, Matt. I'm sorry. No, that's awesome. <laughs> well, for a podcast, that's actually going to work out really oh. well. <laughs> oh, good. So, so yeah, so 32 years. I turn 47 tomorrow, yeah. mate. Um, Happy birthday. So, thank you, buddy. Thank you. This is kind of my early birthday present talking <laughs> to you, buddy, on the show. Um, so, so, yeah, so, it'll be, so basically 32 years I've just clocked over playing guitar. So oh, a man. long time. You know, when people tell me, they say, uh, you know, geez, you play well. And I go, well, after 32 years, if I don't, I pick the wrong profession. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so long time. Wow, man, that's killer. Now, I've seen a, an early picture of you with a, a Yamaha <laughs> RGX. RGX. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did we all own one of those? Yep. Um, yeah, that's why I'm bringing that up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was just recently talking to uh, Rob Chapman. And uh, of Chapman guitars, yeah, right. and he had a oh, yellow cool. one. Yeah, he started off really? on a yellow one. Yeah, oh. I started off. I started off on a red one. Yeah, um, you know, and I had uh, Richie Cotton stickers all over it. Oh, nice. Um, and not real stickers. I'd actually cut cut out the little Richie Carto- uh, Richie Cotton cartoon. There was a little axe that said "Great Chops." <laughs> um, in his, I don't know, in his Laney amp, oh, uh, yeah. early Laney amp. Ad. Oh yeah, and, yeah, um, yeah. I remember that. Do you remember yes. that? Yeah, definitely. And and I stuck that like I just had these things like clear contacted on my guitar. So did you own one too, Matt? Did you I I yet? did. I had an RGX. I think it was a two zero one. Now from memory, your pitch, you had like a humbucker and two singles. Yes, I think it was a three twelve. I think that was called the three one two. I well, could be wrong. Yeah, yeah. Well, mine might have been. Maybe mine was a two one one. I can't remember, but it had. It was the same model, but it had just one single coil at the neck and a humbucker. Uh, uh, okay, but it was the yeah. same guitar. Mine was gunmetal blue. Oh, that would have been sweet. It was sweet, and with its single locking tremolo. That's right, folks. Not double. <laughs> That's single. Right. You could. That's right. You could dive bomb all day long and. It's funny because that's why I bought that guitar, man, because yeah. I learnt, uh, you're going you're gonna to love this, I learnt <laughs> on my father, my father had a flying V. Oh, killer. And it was, and I don't know whether you've ever heard, I don't know how old you are, Matt, but I don't I'm, know I'm, heard. We're about the same age. I'm a little bit older. Oh, you just look so much younger than me. That's okay. just not fair. <laughs> well, you've practiced um, more. <laughs> <laughs> it may be less rock and roll lifestyle for you. Um, but my, my dad, do you remember the brand Axiom? Yeah. A-X-I-O-M. I do. Well, yep. he had an Axiom Flying V, which now they were a copy, but they were a really good instrument. Yeah, right. Um, so, and this one was really well made. And so I learned my, you know, all of my initial shredding years. Yep. Um, I spent probably the first two or three years of my playing on, on that thing. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd show up to these, you know, gigs as a 16-year-old with a, with, <laughs> with a Flying V. Nice. That was a really tall guitar. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so it didn't have, it was a hard tail though. So it didn't have a whammy. Uh-huh. So the reason I bought that RGX was because I could dive bomb all day. Very cool. That was why I bought that guitar. So that was the first guitar I bought with my own money. Oh, very cool. 
Yeah, so so it was uh, a, a rad instrument. They well done. You know, I listened to all of those. I still have some of the there are tape recordings that I did, and my tone was just all horrible. Um, I had a um, uh, an Arion Metal Master pedal, and it was just not pretty. So <laughs> some of those recordings are just not pretty. So. <laughs> that's cool, man. That's that's killer. That's killer. I bought the RGX. It was actually my third electric. I started off on. Um, like some weird Japanese cheese log and then a strap copy. <laughs> <laughs> cheese log. But I Is that needed. A brand? <laughs> I love that. It could be. Uh, I needed a humbucker um, yep. because I, I was playing. Um, I was starting to play places where they had lights. <laughs> I was, oh, right. well, I was, I was playing in. Humming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I didn't. I had no idea. I just these single coils are humming. You need a humbucker. Okay. So I got that. Yeah. Yeah. So because oh, well, they didn't have noiseless single coils back then. No. Um, when did you start playing? Uh, Same time. Well, I was eleven. Um, so oh, okay. I'm forty-seven as well. I'm forty-eight yeah. next month. So we're about the same vintage. So I had a couple of years head start, which yeah, yeah, which I didn't use well because <laughs> it sounds like you took <laughs> off. Um, but yeah, so I was I was about um, so about seventeen, eighteen when I got the. Maybe when I got the RGX, because yeah, I oh, started nice. to play out and yeah. So you were, um, you had the Richie Cotson stickers. So was he an early influence? Yeah, look, it was. I think you know, and you, um, um you're so glad you're my age because we can talk about this stuff and you'll know what I where you know where I'm coming from. That yeah. was just such a golden age of guitar. You know that 19, you know in in the 80s when when we were that age. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, so Richie Cotson came out with his first record, um, and yeah, it was it was huge. It was very big, and and but I was just immersed in guitar. Um, you know, I had started listening to. Um, I remember a friend of mine gave me a tape and said, "You play guitar, listen to this," and it was Mr. Big's first album. Oh wow! And I think I, I would have been about seventeen when that happened. Uh huh. Um, so, and then, uh, Perpetual Burn by Jason Becker came out yeah. at that time. So it was all of that, you know, Malmsteen and, and, um, and Marty Friedman's Dragon's Kiss. And so I was this, this kid in a country town, um, you know, like I grew up in Forbes, there was like you know, 8,000 people in this town and, and I'm listening to stuff like, you know, Tony McAlpine and Marty Friedman. And, you know, so, so needless to say, I, didn't have a lot of uh, musical peers at school. Nobody got, <laughs> nobody got, you know, my obsession with this music. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so so all of those guys, man. Like, uh, but yeah, that that Richie Cotton record um, that that came out with that with that uh, ad with the little great chops that axe, <laughs> you know, that was. Uh, I mean, I, I I wore out probably two or three copies of that, you know. So, and I still love Richie. I mean, he's changed a lot, but um, but you know, he's still a legend. Absolutely, yeah. Um, amazing player, but it was all those guys, man. It was um, you know, the the, the early Malmsteen albums, Rising Force, and and uh, Odyssey and Trilogy, and and um, you know, all of that sort of stuff, uh, just just blew my mind. And um, and then I heard Joe Satriani, and I realised you didn't have to have a singer in a band. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because it was that stuff, and and you know, guys, you know, Mr. Big and Extreme, and and all of those, you know, their first record, and um. But but then when I heard Always With Me, Always With You, I was like, oh, my gosh, you don't actually have to have a singer in a band. <laughs> <laughs> so that that really was a, you know, I think I may, might have been like 16 when that record came out. Um, and then I got Passion and Warfare right after that, you oh, know, and yeah, that, yeah. that was where, that was the whole turning point for me for guitar, Matt. That was when I realized that you can write tunes like a vocal tune, so verse, chorus, verse, chorus, crazy solo, you know. Yeah. But you don't actually have to wait for your solo. You, know? you can actually <laughs> just start soloing from bar one. Um, and so that so was good. Uh, those two guys, you know, um, you know, were were you know monumental uh, in influences on on me and and my writing and and uh, what you could actually do with the because I you know I instrumental guitar. You know, and I know like my friend Michael Dolphy talks a lot about, you know, Hank Marvin and yeah. I missed all of that. Um because my my parents weren't into that sort of music. Sure. But uh, when I when I discovered that you didn't actually have to have a singer, yeah. I was like, Man, doors opened. Yes. So 
so yeah it was uh it was great man but it was you know i could talk about my influences all day there's just hundreds of them were you um were you doing any study at this time or did you go on to to study you know i didn't really take any uh yeah so so after you know after my lessons with uh with that guy michael peters um who i'm still in touch with on facebook today which oh, is a, cool. just a trip man he's just a legend of a guy you know um he stopped playing for many many years and and this is one of the coolest things that's ever happened to me as a guitar player is that he started watching my videos on youtube and facebook and it inspired him to start playing again wow so, wow, so it was kind of, yeah, I know it's just, it does my head in, you know, he sent me a message saying, you know, I've just watched you play and, and, um, you know, I'm inspired to, you know, and he wasn't even thinking about, Hey, I taught you. And this was, he just said, Hey, I've just been watching you play and I'm, I'm inspired to pull my guitar out again. I've got it out of storage. I'm starting to play again. And, and I just wrote him back and I just said, man, well, this is amazing for me because you started it all, man. Like I didn't even want to play guitar. My father made me take lessons from you, um, you know, and, uh, and, and so now it was this whole turnaround thing where, where he started playing again because of, of watching my videos. So um, now, sorry, what was the question, Matt? I, I just shot off on a total. Tangent, no, that's, man. that's a spin out. That's amazing. Um, I know it's crazy. Yeah. So cool. The question was, um, like were you doing any study or okay, how are you yeah. learning? So, so after after uh, Michael stopped, now he got me up to bar chords, you know, and then he sort of moved away again. So, so I he taught me like all of the open chords and then bar chords, and and um, so that was that was pretty much it for for lessons. I took one year of classical guitar. Uh, about two years later. Um, and by then I was just a stone cold shredder, you know, I, so I had taught myself all of that. I taught myself scales. Um, I taught myself how to sweep pick. I taught myself how to speed pick, which incidentally was, and we can talk about this later, I guess, but speed picking was very natural to me. Okay. Um, people have asked me, you know, how, how do you develop such speed, speed picking? And it was just natural to, I just did it. It's, um, it was just something that was always really natural to me. And, and, uh, and about two years after I, you know, I, I had those initial probably 16 lessons with, uh, with Michael, um, just teaching me, uh, you know, open chords and bar chords, I took about a year of classical, which taught me names for stuff that I thought I'd invented. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> which was annoying because, you know, I thought I, you know, I, I was playing these, uh, you know, because I've always had a, you know, and I thank my parents for this. Um, I've always had a pretty highly developed ear. And so I started playing, you know, like working out Steve Vai tunes and, and Joe Satriani tunes and, and then building like, you know, Lydian scales, yep, you yep. know, going, wow. well, this is, this is like a flat five or a sharp four or however you want to say it in, in a scale, man. Like I've just invented this scale. And um, and then I went and took a year of classical, which pretty much taught me names for everything I thought that I invented. <laughs> and I realized that these things have wow. been around for thousands of years wow. and I hadn't invented anything. Um, but uh, but that other than that, everything that, you know, you, you see me do, uh, you know, or hear me do on a recording, I, I've taught myself um, through through sheer obsession of the instrument. Yeah. Um, you know, it's... Um, and you know, as you know, being being my age, we didn't have a YouTube, you know. So yeah, well, I remember well. It was so hard to see people doing this stuff. You'd hear yeah, things on records, exactly, exactly. Um, but if you could just see for five seconds, you'd, you'd at least um, have a head. So I remember hearing tapping. I had no idea, but when I saw someone do it, I went, "Oh, okay, that's what they're doing." Same, same man. <laughs> there, and I can't, I can't remember what guitarist it was. Um, uh, but I just remember hearing the, the, like maybe it was a Nuno thing, or but I remembered hearing them double tap. So doing that, nah, 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 ah, and I'm going, yeah. and I'm sitting down on my guitar, going, "How's he getting that interval? And how is he getting like? Is he doing that with his pinky? How's he doing that so clean?" Yeah, wow. and then I saw, a, a, yeah, I think it was an extreme song, and then I saw a video, uh-huh. and and he, you know he put his right hand on the guitar. And I was like, well, I didn't think of that. <laughs> um, or maybe it was a Van Halen thing. You know? Okay. So yeah, I was right. really young at the time. Um, and uh, But so same thing, because we couldn't see. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and we would just then take our limited knowledge of what we discovered so far on the instrument and try and apply that to everything we were hearing. And so, you know, you know I remember the first time I heard Alan Holdsworth. 
um, and my, my head exploded. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I thought, yeah, man, I'll never sound like that. And that was, you know, one guitar prediction that, um, that came true <laughs> because I, you know, I, even when I had been playing for about, you know, five or six years, I, you know, I, I bought an Alan Holdsworth album because everything else I'd ever like Malmsteen stuff I'd worked out and I worked out the entire record of, uh, wow. um, uh, Steve, Steve Vai's Passion and Warfare. And I'd worked out the entire, you know, surfing with the alien record. So, you know, when you asked me if I was studying, that was study for me. Yeah, I would yeah. put, I would put Saturdays aside. Um, cause Saturdays I, I'd stopped playing sport much to my coaches, you know, cricket coaches disgust. And so Saturday for me was, I would go, okay, what tune am I going to work out today? And it might be the audience is listening by Steve I. And so I would go into my little side room. My parents, uh, you know, had set up a music room for my brother and I, and I would spend nine hours in there just working out that one tune until I could play it. So study for me was working out the guys. That was what I was doing, you know. But we were doing it by ear. Yeah, um, amazing. And man. if you were lucky enough to get a, uh, a guitar magazine with the tab of something, yeah. Um, you know, I remember uh, Guitar World came out with a tab of Jason Becker's Air. Yes. And I yep. spent about three weeks, you know, every <laughs> Saturday is like you know eighteen hours, um, like nine hours uh, a day for three Saturdays, just going through that tune. Wow. Um, so, so that was kind of my study, you know. That was sure. Um, that was that was my whole, uh, you know. I was obsessed. I still am. <laughs> um, and so, so getting back to the Holdsworth thing, I thought, yeah. well, I've worked out all this Jason Becker stuff, and I've worked out, you know, all this, uh, you know, Steve Vai stuff, and so I'm going to go buy an Alan Holdsworth, you know, in a record, and in a month's time, I'll sound like him. Well, that was about twenty five years ago. <laughs> Still don't understand what the guy was doing, man. So, but, um, but yeah, so that was, uh, you know, that's that was my. That was my kind of life, my obsession as a kid, and and I would, um, and then the speed thing hit me, and I guess we'll get to this a bit later as well. But the speed thing hit me, and I just wanted to be faster than everybody else. So I would find out who the guitar player, you know, talk of uh, the guitar community was. If it was Tony McAlpine, I would then go and buy his stuff, and then work it out how to play it, and then I would, you know, punch it up ten clicks on a metronome so I could play it faster than him. Um, so, so they were my formative wow, years. Wow, man! Yeah, that's they were my formative years on yeah. guitar. You know, just trying to be faster than everybody else and realizing that I was never going to sound like Alan Holdsworth. Yeah. <laughs> so that's amazing. Well, that's yeah. I mean, you, you're doing it all, aren't you? You're learning. You have to learn technique to play that stuff. You have to. Yes. And you have to learn the. Well, you were learning the sounds of the scales. You were learning the. Yeah. yeah intervals exactly. and how to deal with all that stuff. Yeah. So was Holdsworth. I guess Hold, Holdsworth is from another planet to those other yes. guys um, harmonically. It was he the big harmonic awakening for you? Um, yeah, yeah, he was because, you know, as you know, a lot of those metal guys um, and shred guys that, that we were all listening to, it, you know, everything was pretty straight. Everything was pretty vanilla, um, you know, harmonically for the most part, you know, once, you know, you got your head around, you know, the fact that Malmsteen was – you know, using, uh, you know, harmonic minor scales and all of that sort of stuff, which was a little bit different to all the other guys just playing sure. fast pentatonic stuff. And, yeah. and Jason Becker and, uh, you know, he was he was doing a lot of sort of fast minor stuff and, and yeah. you know, Marty Friedman introduced some interesting, you know, Asian sounding scales. Yeah, sure. But, but Holsworth was the first guy that I listened to and I really just couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, so he was the harmonic awakening and from there he kind of led the way and I didn't get it at the time um, in my 20s, but, you know, he led the way f for me getting into a lot of those, you know, fusion players. Yeah. Okay. Which, you know, I kind of feel like I missed out because I, you know, growing up, you know, in my teens, you know, if they did a, uh, if they did a, uh, you know, Guitar World did a story on Frank Gambale, I would go, <laughs> He's not a metal guy. I don't want to buy that issue. Um, and then when I finally did hear him, I was like, oh, my God, this guy's a freak. Um, you know, he's out playing a lot of the metal guys. Um, so so Holsworth for me, um, he kind of opened the door to, you know, the Gambales and the Greg Howes. And, and, um, and, I mean, he, and there was this other thing that happened to me. I was I, – I, every now and then I would do this Sunday afternoon gig, and I think I was about, you know, 19 or 20 years old and it was an acoustic gig and I hated playing acoustic guitar so 
Um, and all kind of people would come. It was like a restaurant thing and all kind of people would come to this thing. And I remember just uh, doing this uh, gig with this other guy who would play guitars and he would throw me solos. And of course, I would just speed pick like a demon over everything. <laughs> and this old Spanish guy came up to me, he would have been about 50 years old. Yeah. And he said, and I, and I was about 20. And he said, man, you sound like Aldi Miola. And I was like, who? <laughs> you know, and I, you know, he was like, yeah, man, yeah. he said, I could just swear that you had grown up listening to him. You sound just like him. Because I was doing like, I was just being Malmsteen on an acoustic yes. guitar. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so I was like, okay, well, I better go and check this out. So uh, I, I rocked up to, um, uh, so you know, I might have even been a utopia or something like that. But, um, and, and they had, I was like Al Miola, Al Miola, and they had one record. It was Friday night in San Francisco, and it was him and John McLaughlin and Paco oh, de Lucia. Wow. And and I don't know whether you've ever heard that that yeah, tape, I have, that yeah. album, and yep. it's mind blowing. Yes, I I got in my car and I put it in, and it was just these three guys playing acoustic guitar faster than most guys I'd ever heard could play on an electric. Um, and so that was a whole other direction I shot off into as well. So all of a sudden in my twenties, my mind was, you know, I'd, I'd grown up listening to metal and I was a metal purist. And if you knew me back then, Matt, you know, and you tried to say, Hey, listen to Alan Holdsworth or Frank Kemba, I would have gone, no, I listened to metal. <laughs> <You know? laughs> what does Steel Panther say? Death to all but metal. Um, <laughs> and I think I was about 25 before I slightly opened my ears to other styles of music and, and uh, and discovered that sort of you know you know between twenty and twenty five I guess I discovered uh, all of these other guitarists that were just mind blowing and you know so uh, so so it was yeah it was it was all that stuff you know and I sort of realised there was a much wider world of, and I'm still realising there's a much wider world of of harmonic content hmm. you know yeah, out right. there than than we as guitar players you know, possibly explore all the time. Yeah, sure. I guess I I bring up the harmonic. I idea um because I, I i totally get what you're saying a lot of the a lot of the shred guys were diatonic mm-hmm. depending on whatever mode they were using as you said uh it's not to sniff at that stuff though and the fact that you no. worked out passion and warfare I, I worked out a few licks and then messed with them and incorporated them a lot of us you know did that or did a really bad version of um you know sisters i learned my Jimi hendrix chordal vocabulary <laughs> Yep. Through Sisters, the, yep. the Steve Pye song. Yep, I know it. But man, for you to get through the whole record, and a few of my guests have done stuff like this. Um, I think Dolce got through a lot of Vinnie Moore and then he the did, first Satriani, yeah. uh, the surfing album. Um, Joel McDonald, um, I think I think he did the Eric Johnson uh, big hit, RVM Musicom. RVM Musicom, yeah. See, that was I didn't discover that until much later on when I heard Cliffs of Dover and I was just, again, a totally different vibe yeah, yeah. to anything else that was out there. And just, just be- his note choice is just beautiful. Mm. Um, you know, so, so yeah, but that, yeah, that would have been a great album to learn too. And I didn't do that until I was, I, I think I did most of that record um, when I was living in America. I moved to America uh, in my 20s and lived there for three years. Um, and I think uh, I think I tackled that record while I was out there. I went through a massive Eric Johnson phase. <laughs> this is awesome. So, so you're like, oh yeah, I didn't really learn that record, but yeah, later on I did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, but see, and that's what I. And it's it's funny because now I never do that. Um, you know, now I I if if I've got time to play guitar, uh, and I guess we all do this as we get older. I would rather write. Right, uh, sure. my, my own stuff, yeah. or or you know, practice something that I'm working on at the time, um, you know, which is all devi- it's it's all derived from everything that's in our musical DNA, from what we grew up listening yeah, to. Yeah, for sure. But uh, but yeah, so now it's it's I'm completely 180. Is I don't ever sit down and work out anything anymore. <laughs> so you've probably worked out enough. You're probably yeah, okay I, to get going. I feel like I did my time. <laughs> that. You know, I woke up one day Definitely. and I was like, yeah, you know, I just want to do my own stuff. Wow. Um, you know, cause I had this massive vocabulary of stuff. Um, but people would say, um, and this is really before the whole shred thing happened, you know, but people would say, man, that guy sounds like Richie Cotton or man, that guy reminds me of Steve Vai. And I got to the point where I was like, I really have to develop my own voice. Um, and to do that, I just have to stop playing everybody else's music. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> um, which I which I did. So, um, and some of it's not a conscious decision, as you know. You get older and you get better, and then people start hiring you for gigs, and mm-hmm. you just don't have the time 
to um, sit down and, and work out that stuff. For sure. Yeah, you're like you're learning arrangements. You're getting Yeah, you're learning arrangements. You're getting work done. Learning, rather... Yeah, you're getting work done and recording solos on other people's records. And, and, and I think that's a great step. You know, that's a great way to start to develop your own voice. Yeah, awesome. Well, your your first solo album came out in two thousand and four. The album on, yeah. And um, I mean, I think I think by there you you're definitely synthesizing a lot of these ideas. It's definitely your own voice. Um, there's some really interesting harmonic things going on. There's you know burning guitar, of course, across the whole yeah. thing. Um, yeah. So it's a, it's a great collision of I don't know to pitch not to pigeonhole it, but if you, if you had to put a sticker on it, if you had to put it in JB Hi-Fi somewhere, it'd mm. be under um, mind-blowing um, <laughs> metallic prog or something. Because I, everybody that ever knew me expected me to release a full-on metal record okay. for my first day. And that kind of isn't. No. That's got, it's got some heavier stuff on it um, and some proggier stuff on it. But yeah. there's there's also a lot of Greg Howe-influenced. Um, there's a song on that called The V-Blues and a song called Stretching on the Nines, um, which are very Greg Howe. I, I discovered Greg Howe during the recording, the writing for that record, and and uh, and I became obsessed with him. And I'm, I still am obsessed with Greg Howe. I mean, we all love Greg. but So that a lot of that, you know, I actually kind of went, a little bit away from the whole metal thing then. And I, I did, you know, I stopped kind of, that was, you know, my fusion years, yep. uh, <laughs> you know, in, you know, and I, I sort of stopped listening to, to metal when I, when I recorded that record and there's still like the first track of that was just a shred fest. And that was, um, that was me and Pete Drummond getting together and going, you know, Hey, let's do something ridiculous. <laughs> um, which incidentally we're doing again right now. For oh, the really? Guitar show. Yeah. We're, well, we're doing a record, uh, together at the moment and, oh, fantastic. you know, and, and we're, we're right back where we were, you know, 15 years ago going, let's just do something ridiculous. <laughs> um, so, That's great, uh, but, but that was, that was, uh, you know, and I wrote that tune really as a vehicle for, for me to that, like that on the first tune on that yeah. record, um, game on, um, as a vehicle for me to just, you know, play ridiculous chops and then for him to just play ridiculous, his drum solo on that is just insane. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I stood there and watched him record. That was actually the first thing that we ever did together. It was the first time we ever kind of hung out and, and I found out later that he was terrified. He had heard my solo on that and just went, oh, my God, how am I going to compete with this guy? And then he did, um, you know, <laughs> and he recorded that really quickly. Wow. Like I just sat in his studio with him when he did yeah. that. Um, and uh, But other than that, there was a lot of, you know, I, I'm going to try and sound like Greg Howe on this record. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and I hadn't worked out any Greg Howe <laughs> songs in, in you know, with, you know, in my new true, uh, I'm not going to play anybody else's music now, um, but uh, but yeah, there's a lot of kind of funk fusion elements in yeah, that yeah. as well. But I always sound like a metal guitar player, no matter what I do. <laughs> so so yeah, there's always that element of prog shred craziness in there, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh mate, it's a great it's a great recipe. It's a great bunch of stuff put together. Yeah, it was fun, man. It was yeah, just a you know a home recording, and it was just you say there was no time constraints and nice and um you know it was just time for me to sit down and really kind of start to say what do i want to sound like recorded um you know playing my own music i guess so yeah cool now when i first became aware of you i think yeah it was around that time of the sydney guitar show back in yep 2007 so it's a couple of years after your record pete drummond was playing with you then as yes. well yep he um, was yeah and man, there was a lot of talk about forty notes per second. Not from yeah. you, I should say, from other people. This was something that uh, because we were messing around with a program called oh, what was it called? Transcribe Six or something. It was at the time. Okay. Where um, my bass player Joe Manton at the time had this program that you could slow something down to one percent of its original speed. Wow. And uh, and I had just signed on as an endorsee with uh, with Godin Guitars, yeah. And they had never had 
a profile player in Australia. And so they were kind of just going, hey, man, can't believe I've got, we've got this guy. And, you know, they're great guitars, you know, and I've used them for years. And I still have a couple of the strats here that I use because uh-huh. um, they're just really, really, you know, well put together. And so I've changed the pickups in them and stuff, but they're really well put together instruments. Um, and so we were messing around with this transcribe program and and it was a total joke. Um, Joe and I, we were, you know, Joe was like, let's see how fast you can play. So I played this thing. It was 15, 15 notes per string across three strings in a second. So essentially it was 45 <laughs> notes there, but I couldn't f- quite fit them all in. <laughs> and we did it as a joke. And I think yeah. I did about 42 or 43 notes in yeah. that second. Um, so it was just like, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, five notes, five notes on the, the high E string, um, and you'd move it up a tone and do five notes and then you do move it back a tone and do another five notes. And then you would do that on the B string and then, you know, on the, on the G string. So we did it as a joke just to mess around with this program. And he was like, you know, we kind of just laughed and forgot about it. You know, Joe was like, Oh, you nearly fit those, all those notes and you just played 43 notes in a second. So, and we were on tour doing a clinic um, with the whole band and back in those days, you know, it was really great. Companies would just pay for Joe and Pete and I to just yeah, fly around yeah. the country doing clinics. It was marvelous. We did about 30 of these things a year. Um, and, uh, and we were just with the, the company rep and, and we played him this thing and, uh, and, you know, we saw, oh, yeah, we did this thing. And, and, you know, when Jeremy played like 42 notes and, you know, in this second, you know, and here, here it sounds slowed down and here's the, here's the thing fast. And, and he, you know, and these guys in companies, they, they just see marketing, you know, they just sure, see marketing yeah. opportunities yeah, straight away. Enough, so, yeah, yeah. so the next thing I know, <laughs> he's gone and done some research. And well, the previous guy's only done 36 notes in a second and you can do 42. And, and, and we all thought it was a bit of fun at the time. But what, what happened with that was that um, a couple of things is that, you know, they really pushed that. I never wanted to go down that road. That was not anything that I ever planned. They pushed it as a marketing thing. Now, yeah, it, it did get my name out there, sometimes in good ways, sometimes in not so good ways. Um, but what, what I found would happen is I would go and play the tunes live as I recorded them. And you would have people in the audience with their arms, you know, folded, watching every run going, well, that was fast, but it wasn't 42 notes a second. Oh, wow. And, oh, and it just became this thing where everybody expected me to play at my top speed all the time. Yeah. So, so I, I discovered there was a, you know, I started feeling a little bit of that pressure because my friends would say, oh, you know, there was a guy there that was going, there was probably run, one, one run in that whole show that was 40 odd notes a second, you know, and people, you know, what guitar <laughs> How is it like? Yeah, I know. It's crazy. Um, you know, so, yeah. so well, that was fast, but it wasn't 40 notes a second, you know, and, and so I felt this pressure because I was wow. a younger guy at the time. Now I don't care, you know. Yeah. But can I just, I was a younger, can I jump so, in though? It's yeah, not yeah. as if there's not enough incredible musicianship that wasn't already happening at one of your shows by the way yeah well i, I know you know because, it's, oh, i just don't get and, it and i don't completely blame the guitar players because the marketing around me at the time from, yeah okay from godin was sure fastest guitarist in the world he can play 40 notes a second blah 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 and that was just every time my name every time i did a festival every time i did a guitar yeah, show okay. every time i did a clinic yeah. there was that little tag that was under my note you can play 42 notes a second um you know what i mean so it wasn't completely their fault yeah but okay. i found what was going on was i was going out and just shredding my brains out so if you can imagine shredding is chocolate you know how <laughs> you feel sick after too much chocolate well by you know by by song two you had all the chocolate you could handle you know, but because there was this pressure on me and the whole band at the time yeah, right. to just be re- playing. Re- so all of the musicality for, for a little while there just went totally out of the show. And, and I remember we were on the road um, going and doing another one of these things in Cowra, I think, you know, and there was like 150 tickets had been sold. And I said to the guys, we stopped for lunch and I said, you know what, we're really not playing this music as it was written. I said, because we just all feel so much pressure to just, you know, go from zero to to a million. Um, and I said, there's nothing in between. And, you know, the songs that were written, you know, Game On, for example, which was recorded at 140 BPM, we were playing like 165 BPM live. Wow. 
So that was a turning point where I decided that I said, look, we've really got to distance ourselves from this whole fastest guitarist in the world thing. Um, because there were these massive arguments springing up online between my fans and Rusty Cooley's fans. <laughs> and they're going, well, Jeremy's way faster than Rusty Cooley. And Rusty Cooley's fans, he's like, he's not faster than Rusty Cooley. Rusty Cooley's faster than, you know, and, and uh, you know, it became like a Simpsons episode. You know? it's like, oh, man. Is Superman faster than the Flash? You know what I mean? It, it, it became that. And the funniest thing was is that I was talking to these guys online, yeah. Rusty and, and Michelangelo, because we all we all knew of each other and we yeah. all so have these email chats yeah none of us cared yeah right right you know what i mean it was just all these this fan stuff going back and forth and you know people get really heated about it which uh -huh. I, you know it's i, I don't understand <laughs> why <laughs> you know people were blocking each other on on you know youtube and stuff because you know they'd said that rusty cooley was faster than me well i'm never going to speak to him again you know so <laughs> so the fans blew it up you know, and I just watched all of this happening and just watched the musicality disappear from yeah, everything that we were yeah, doing okay. and just went, you know what? We really need to distance ourselves from this whole fastest guitarist in the world thing. And so I really, I took that off all the marketing and, and uh, you know, like the guitar show. I still did all the, the Adelaide guitar shows and the Melbourne guitar shows and all of that. But mm -hmm. I just really made sure to say, hey, can we just not go down that path? Yeah, right. Um, and lo and behold, you know, if, you know, eventually, uh, and I mean, it didn't help either that, you know, Guitar World magazine came out, uh, it was like a 2010 issue or a 2009 issue, and it had the 50 fastest guitarists of all time, and I was in there. <laughs> um, you know, so that just fueled the whole thing. Okay. You know? so, and that was great, because I didn't know that was happening. That was yeah. an American guitar magazine, and yeah. I started getting texts from people going, hey, man, congratulations on your mention, man. Like, I'm going, what? What? What are you people talking about? And... Um, and I went and bought that magazine. It had Malmsteen on the cover, and it was like fifty fastest guitarists of all time. And um, and and there was like all the big names, but there was this, you know, the actual fifty far, you know, underground fastest guitarists of all time. Okay. And I was equal, and I was equal third. Okay. Um. So uh. So you know. So I. That was cool. It was cool that that happened because, like I said, that was an you know I'd always wanted to be in that magazine, so that was kind of a cool thing. But sure, at that point we were trying to say, hey, there's more to me than just speed, which you know took many years to sort of. I think I didn't get hired for a lot of gigs because people would go, oh yeah, he's that shredder guy. Um, so uh, and then I started playing country, and you know, <laughs> wow, who saw that coming? Yeah, well, as a working musician, I mean, um, yeah, that's interesting. The backlash then, if you weren't getting gigs, because in the in recent years, actually, for a long time, you've been playing lots of different genres and playing lots of gigs, yeah. and obviously making a, a living, um, being a very versatile musician. Which, yeah, maybe not everyone um, would know about, or especially people who are who are stuck in that that period about 10 or so years ago yeah exactly um and that's one of the things that uh, i hang out a lot with michael dolshi and i know you know michael the yeah, amazing yeah. he's probably one of my favorite guitarists ever yeah and so he saw that side of me from years ago uh -huh. um me just doing little you know finger picking pieces and all that sort of stuff and we would you know go and do master classes and be on the road jamming and stuff you know and and, uh, and you know he's always been a very big advocate whenever he's heard people go oh yeah jeremy yeah he's great guitar player but you know just just a fast guy and michael go no he's not <laughs> he can play jazz you know like i'm about as jazz as the chair you're sitting on but you know um <laughs> th there was another <laughs> there was another uh you know there he saw that other side of me and and you know then I, I started getting session work and uh and then everybody else has started to see that as well you know but i think people like having me there because they go well, if there is an opportunity for, you know, in the show for somebody to just let loose, at least yeah. we can just turn around and go, hey, JP, just go nuts. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, you know, and stuff can happen. <laughs> we can, you know, hit that gear. But um, it has been fun sort of just getting out of, because uh, I did nothing but guitar circles for years, you know, like clinics and, and guitar festivals and, and um, you know, the LA guitar scene. I went over and won a bunch of competitions there. Yeah, okay. Um, so, you know, it was nice to actually step on stage and not have it be all about me. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that and still do. Yeah, awesome, man. The the LA thing, like you said you moved to the states for 3 years. Was that mm. was that in that period? It well, I was actually in my 20s. Okay. Um so it was 
uh, I think, yeah, it was kind of, uh, it was just before I got back and, and got the indoor. So it was just before the whole fastest guitarist in the world thing um, happened. So I lived there from from about 23 till about 26. And then I came back and went instantly into the golden endorsement. Oh, okay. Yeah, sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, but the great thing about America is that there's no tall poppy syndrome over there. So they recognize excellence straight away and they love it. Um, and they encourage it, you know, where, you know, we tend to, you know, fold our arms and, you know, the old joke, how many guitar players does it take to change a light bulb? You know, yeah. 10, one to do it and nine to fold their arms and say, I could have done it faster. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, it's kind of not like that over there. Um, they were very open armed and, and uh, you know, loved it. So I went out, I actually had a friend, um, we, were, we were doing a gig um, in on uh, Sunset. We were doing a gig at the Whiskey. And, uh, you know, which isn't as glamorous as it sounds because you've got to pay to play over there. Right. So, you know, you go to the venue and they give you 100 tickets and you've got to go out and sell them. You'll sell them, yeah. And if you don't sell them, then you actually have to pay the cost, you know, the, the, the difference. So, so I know that sounds glamorous, but it really isn't as glamorous yeah, as it right. sounds. But <laughs> you said, hey, I entered you in a guitar competition today. So there was the Inland Empire of Los Angeles Guitarist of the Year competition, which, mm-hmm. I, uh, which I ended up winning. Um, and then I did another couple of, you know, um, you know, uh, Alta Loma district music guitar competition. So, so, you know, those, you know, LA guitar wars and, and that sort of stuff. So mm-hmm. I ended up going out there and winning some competitions and, and they loved it, man. They, they were really encouraging. And, and I, uh, I got to record, actually, there is a lost EP, which I should send you, I should digitize and send you, um, cause I did do an EP. I won one of those competitions and one of the, the, the prizes was studio time. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so there is an EP, uh, of, uh, stuff that was just never really released. It was just something that I did and, and gave out at gigs in America. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, and I think I have maybe two copies of it left. So, I should nice. digitize it and release that to the world. Do it, man. Um, I can't even remember what it was called now. <laughs> I think it was called Eccentric, um, because again, it had a, a few different styles on there. But, um, but I should find that. You've just jogged my memory. Nice. So there is there is unreleased music out there which I should try and find. Um, I want to talk about your music because uh, you mm. you sent me some new stuff. Can we? Yeah. I, I kind of diverted when I brought up the American thing, but you were talking about playing with Troy Kemp. That's been like a long-term gig. Yeah. In the, the country, well, the country rock kind of scene. Yeah. In Australia. And he's a great name. Is it true he's heading stateside? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he's just going through that whole nightmare process at the moment. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, so he has been granted extraordinary alien status. Wow. So, uh, and that, that thing's a novel. Um, so anybody okay. that listens to this, that's thinking of, of moving to America as a musician, yeah, save up <laughs> because it ain't cheap. Yeah. Um, right. and you know, cause you know, it was one of those things where they ask for, you know, any awards you've got and, uh, any articles that have been written about you, but then they want a letter from the person that wrote the article about you. Okay. To say that it was real, it was just a nightmare of a process. Wow. For, I feel bad for the guy. So, but yeah, he is heading stateside. Yeah, right. Um, and uh, and we'll continue to write and stuff, you know, with the the, the marvel that is the internet. You know, we'll continue yeah, to write cool. music and um, and that's one of the other weird things that people might not expect um, from from me as a as a well known shred guitar player. Yeah. But I write a lot of tracks on country. I mean, I wrote you know uh, eleven of the thirteen tracks on Troy's record with him nice that's fantastic um and we wrote you know i've written for jasmine ray i've written for you know many many people nearly rich and you know a bunch of uh um you know fairly well-known country artists so so that's been a really weird kind of it's funny where life takes you isn't it it, matt yeah definitely it's been a real weird kind of thing to have people contact me and go hey i know that you got this cut on such and such record and and uh, I really love that song. Can I come and write with you? Wow, awesome! And it's a country artist. Yeah. So, so that's a whole, you know, that's a whole weird kind of you know <laughs> thing that, you know, if you'd have told me that that was going to happen ten years ago, I probably well maybe I guess I was playing in Dave Glee when Dave Gleason left the Screaming Jets. I played with him for about three years, and that oh, was kind okay. of a country wow. rock thing. Yeah, right. Um, which was my first intro into the whole country rock thing, and then I. You know, when he stopped doing that, he got the gig with the Angels, and and uh, I just went back into Shredland. Um, 
Man, what an interesting like introduction to country is <laughs> through Dave yeah, Gleeson. Well, I know, and that's what it, he um, – because he had been a country fan, and I mean a real country fan, and a lot of people might not know that about him, being that he came to, to fame in the Screaming Jets. But yeah, he was yeah. a, like, hardcore – Merle Haggard, Johnny Cash. Really? Wow. You know, Hank, or, you know, old school country fan. Yeah. And so uh, so I we went out and did, it was called Dave Gleason and the Stilsons. Ah, oh, yeah. I remember that um, name. Yeah. So so I was the guitar player in the Stilsons. Very and, cool. And we did that. We did that for about, I don't know, two and a half years. Yeah. Um, and then he sort of, uh, you know, the Screaming Jets did a couple of things together and then he got the Angels gig and so that all just kind of dissipated. Sure. But that was my intro into the Australian country music scene mm-hmm. and I just met a lot of people because obviously, you know, Dave Gleeson being who he was, a lot of people wanted to come and see him and, and um, you know, I met a lot of people and then um, when I showed up again with, with Troy Kemp 12 years later, um, or ten years later, a lot of these guys were all still there. You know? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, like the Glenn Hannas of the world, and 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 you know all of those oh, guys yeah. who who had followed my shred career um, over that period. And so when I showed up playing for Kempy, you know, it was kind of welcomed with open arms, which was really nice. It's a really lovely. Um, they're a really lovely bunch of people. It's a great scene, that yeah, country scene. They're cool. all very encouraging and supportive, and. And um, you know, once you once you get a gig with somebody, and you know, you do a half decent job, then you find yourself getting phone calls all over the show. That's great, man. Um, so so yeah, so the country thing just kind of fell into my lap, and um, it was really good because going into it, I thought, yeah, I'm this rip and shred guitar guy. You know, I can I can play forty notes a second. <laughs> um, you know, I'm going to learn country guitar and I'm going to conquer it in ten minutes. And and um, and I got this, uh, you know, you get these country courses and it was a book and a CD. Um, so, again, really before internet was, you know, it was dial-up internet back in those days when I started that, you know, so you could, you know, open a page on the internet, go and get a cup of coffee and come That's back right. and be about half downloaded. <laughs> I'm sure you remember that. So so I went and got this country course and, and very quickly realized, I think very quickly the words came out of my mouth, how the hell am I going to play that? Um, I went into <laughs> I went into country guitar very arrogantly because I'm you know thinking that I was this okay. you know, shred king guy, and and very quickly had my ass kicked by all of this wicked weird open string and and hybrid picking and but um, I have spent a lot of time learning to chicken pick and 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 play country and it's been great for my shredding because it's sort of opened a whole world of hybrid picking that I didn't have access to before. Okay. I was um, going to um I was going to ask yeah, had you been doing any hybrid picking like through no, you know, the Holdsworth stuff or anything? Never. Yeah, right. Never. Interesting. And that was one of those things that I kind of just missed that whole hybrid picking thing being so obsessed with uh, speed picking and sweet picking and 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 the whole legato thing you know I really I missed the hybrid picking thing because again in my you know I had this you know stupid addictive personality where I get fixated on on a bunch of things to the exclusion of everything else. And so every time, you know, in, you know, they used to have those instructional columns in guitar world magazine and guitar player. And, and every time anything country came up, I would just skip that. Yeah. I would skip that page. I'm not interested in that. Not realizing just the wealth of cool stuff. Yeah. Right. Uh, that I was missing. Yeah. And um, so when I finally did, I think it was about 30 years old when I, when I started playing country guitar and so well established, been playing for 15 years, could play pretty much anything um, technically that you could uh, hope for and then get introduced to country guitar and I was just right back to being a baby <laughs> for no <laughs> idea. But it was more than that too, Matt. It was like all of my tones were really saturated uh-huh. and really heavy gain tones and yeah. I had no idea how to get – uh, that, that, those country tones. I don't know what you were like. Whether you had a great um, idea of of how to get all these tones, but I knew how to sound like a metal guitar player uh-huh. or a fusion guitar player. Yeah, and I I had no idea when I started hearing these tones, and I'm, you know, so I would just get my, 
you know, heavy gain, you know, whatever I was using at the time. I think at that, that point I had a, um, remember the JMP ones, the rack mount JMP yeah, ones? Yeah, the, the Marshall print. The Marshall thing. stuff. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So I had that stuff and, and I'm, I'm set on OD2, which is just metal territory. <laughs> and all I'm doing is just trying to turn the gain out of OD2. To, and yeah. I just could not get that sound. Yeah. Um, so it was more than just getting my ass kicked by the licks. Yeah, it was uh, it was really sitting down and going. Well, how do I get those crunch tones? Those they're not quite distorted tones, but you know they're they're a little more than you know just break up sound. Yeah, so that was yeah, yeah. that was a whole journey for me, man. That's like cool. getting into that thing. Then I discovered a marvelous thing called compression, which oh. I pretty much completely ignored up until that point. <laughs> And uh, and that opened and that opened a lot of doors as well. So well, your shred tone is so compressed anyway. You probably didn't need one of exactly. those pedals and, previously. Well, as, yeah, as you know, the more the more gain you add, the more compression you get. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was getting all of those sounds. Although you know, over the years, speaking of tone, I would hear those uh, you know those eighties mega clean sounds on yes. all that eighties kind of pop yep. stuff. I would go, I don't know how to get that sound. I'll yeah, just, you know, okay. and I would write it. And it was compression, you know. I didn't yeah. discover compression until I like my late 20s. Yeah. And I felt like I'd been totally ripped off. I was like, <laughs> man, this, this thing is amazing. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so the, the, the country thing just kind of fell into my lap and I, and I worked really hard. And in the end, there was a guy, uh, you know Dave Holmes? Yes, you I do. You know Dave Holmes. Yeah, so yeah. Dave Holmes, you may not know, is a fierce, fierce chicken picker. I actually do know that. And yeah, um, yeah but it, it blew my head off when the first time I heard him doing it. Absolutely. Yeah, so, and he, he can do that stuff really authentically. Yes. And, yeah. and Dave Holmes is one of the first guys I ever saw. I've been playing guitar for a month when I saw Dave Holmes and he oh, came through okay. my town. And I was like, oh my God, this guy's amazing. And I met him a couple of times over the years. And um, and then I saw him playing somewhere, and I went up to him and said, "Hey, I'm Jeremy. I've met you a couple of times. The last time would have been about 15 years ago, and this was back in 2002 or something." Mm-hmm. And um, and we hit it off. And so he said, "Look, come over to the house. Let's have a jam." And uh, so I, you know, I went over to his house and and um, pulled out some just ridiculous licks. I remember the first thing I ever played for him. Um, cause I said, look, I saw you playing when I was, I'd been playing for about a month and you blew me away. And then I went over to his house and I just did this sweet picking thing. And I remember the first things he ever said to me about my guitar playing is he said, Oh my goodness, that's ferocious. <laughs> so we made this deal. I would go over to his house about once a month on a Friday afternoon. Yeah. And I said, cause he would say, how do you do that? How do you do that shred thing? How do you do that sweet picking? I said, I'll make you a deal. I'll teach you how to do this stuff. If you teach me how to do all that cool chicken picking oh, stuff. Oh, that is so good. So once a month, I would go and sit with Dave and, and for half an hour, I would go, do this. And then he would go, do this. So, so I kind of, I got, a, got a, I feel really lucky. I got a great head start, you know. Um, That's great. Dave, Dave basically said, you teach me how to shred and I'll teach you how to chicken pick. So that was kind of the basis of it, you know, and then um, yeah, it just kind of grew from there. When you're That's cool, man. And you've um you've played with a mutual friend uh, of ours now, Jane Denham, as well. Yeah, through, through yeah. That Troy connection. So it, they had that big single, obviously, last year. Yeah, well, they they um they, they did uh, hung up on you last year, and um and Jane uh, started coming along uh, to to Kempy shows and and doing that in the set, and um you know and then. We did this cruise back in February, so I did a couple of gigs with Jane then. So, uh, and we got a few more coming up uh, in July, I think. Oh, that's great! We got man. a Queen- Queensland run with Jane and Troy in July. So, so yeah, the country thing keeps going on, and and um, you know, it's it's a really the country thing's great because you know playing metal and and fusion and all of that sort of stuff in this country. You know, you may not get an opportunity to step out on stage in front of twenty thousand people very often. Yeah, yeah. But playing with these country artists and these festivals, then you, you can do it fairly regularly. 
play in front of thousands of people because that's kind of they're those festivals that are really hot right now so so it's kind of a good thing to do to 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 keep your big stage performance chops up so you know even though i might not get to play a million notes in those gigs so amidst you know, all this busyness and doing these great country gigs and the festivals and things um you're still writing your own solo stuff with um a very progressive or fusiony fusiony edge um, yeah uh, there's a lot of interest in when's when's the next Jeremy Barnes record coming out. Um, well, what's the story? It's there's you know like like I always tend to do. I just uh, I just book lots and lots of projects. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm I'm doing some stuff with Pete Drummond right now because we've been you know we've been doing this together for yeah, a long as you time mentioned yeah now. awesome um, and he's the he's the drummer that I really love to work with. He's just just anything you throw at that guy. Um, he can play and as a musician himself, he's one of the scariest musicians that you could ever hope to meet as far as the guy plays keyboards. Amazing. He sings amazing. Um, I, I started teaching him guitar a couple of years ago and he can shred on that now. So it's oh, kind of not fair. His, <laughs> his level of ability is really kind of not fair. That's amazing. Um, I only knew him as a drummer. So, well, he does all of this other stuff. He composes music. Um, he's composed music for documentaries and like orchestral music. And wow. he's a freak. He's a freak. So, so anytime I get to work with him is, is great. Um, and so we're, we're sort of uh, writing some stuff together at the moment. Um, but as far as my solo record, I want to have something out by the end of this year. And I've really, uh, you know, I kind of have, have canned a lot of um, session stuff. Uh, this year I came into this year with a whole thing of I'm only going to play with a select few artists and I'm really going to work on my own stuff Mm -hmm. Um, and and you know in in fact I had the first four months um, uh, off playing any kind of weekend gigs so I could I could do some recording so hopefully by the end of this year and I've got a couple of I'm doing a concept record at the moment which I'm actually singing on as well awesome yeah I've Um, I've heard you sing you you got chops so, oh, thank you, man. So, and it's about, I mean, people have always said, you've got a really good voice. Why don't you ever sing? So this is, it's a full prog metal record. Um, and there's a lot of instrumental stuff, which I'm writing at the moment. Um, but there's also, I'm doing, I'm singing on it as well. Cool, man. Um, Very cool. And, uh, and it's, um, it's, it's based on a C.S. Lewis book. Um, called the Screw Tape Letters. I don't oh know yeah, ever, well, I have read, read, that. read that. Yes, yeah. So, so wow. I'm, I'm sort of set that to music, which is which is a lot of fun. I'm setting it to music. So there's Dude. a combination of uh, proggy instrumental craziness, yeah. But there's also a lot of vocal songs, you know, a la you know Neil Morse band sort of uh, okay. type yeah, thing yeah, as yeah. well. So, yeah, I can see so that. that cool. That is kind of the next kind of uh, thing that I'm going to be released. Well, the next thing I'm kind of probably going to release is the thing with Pete Drummond. Yeah, okay. Because instrumental music is is easy to write for me, um, and, uh, and and for us, um, it's a whole other thing of of taking a story and and writing lyrics as well. Yeah, <laughs> man, yeah. that that adds some time uh, to to any project. Yeah, so. So, uh, but yeah, I kind of want to have new music out uh, by the end of by the end of this year. Would be nice. That's great, man. Um, you That's know, great. And I'm. It's it's going to be epic. It's going to be pretty epic. Everything's pretty long, and and it's all very. And you've heard a couple of things. So some of it's you know quite heavy and quite intense. And as usually, with, you know, as usual with me, there's lots of notes involved. Yeah, it's great. Um, <laughs> but there's some. So there's a lot more harmonic content. I feel like you know yeah. than there used to be. So I'm trying that anyway. I'm trying to do that. <laughs> That's cool, man. That's awesome. So you sent me um, some parts of tracks, a slight, a slight of hand and a dystopian. Yeah. So is that the the stuff with Pete or is that part of the That's, the, the that's all my stuff. Okay. That's all my stuff oh, right cool, now. man. So Excellent. Um, and there's, you know, one of those, the slight of hand is a bit more of a fusion kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, and uh, dystopian tragedy is is much more the direction that 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 uh, the concept record is going to go. It's much heavier.
and I've gotten into a lot of the, the multi-fingered tapping thing, which which appears a lot on that uh, yeah, dystopian awesome. tragedy track because it's it allows you to move around the neck very quickly. Yeah. So, um, you know, so I'm a big I'm a big fan of the multi-fingered tapping thing. You know, I tend That's I awesome. use uh, I use like all four fingers on my left hand, but I use uh, the two middle fingers on my right hand. Um, okay. So I'm do, yep. doing a lot of that at the moment. So I'm addicted to it. That's cool, man. When I see you tap, what I what I love about it, I mean, there's you approach it in lots of different ways. I mean, the multi tapping mm-hmm. is is mind blowing. But one thing I notice it, it some of your phrases it sounds more like just um, you're just extending legato technique. It's not it's like oh here's a tapping lick, like yeah. you're doing some really interesting legato passages. It, it seems like a in those instances it's a it's it's just very musical. I guess it's less of a a freaky I just, effect. I like I like the sound of that, and mm-hmm. it's one of those interesting things where um, speed picking is quite, you know, uh, and it might not make sense to anybody else. This is just how my my weird head works. Speed picking is quite an obnoxious way to play fast because there's a lot of attack on the strings, and there's a lot of that. Sort yeah, of, you yeah, know. sure. Um, and I worked very hard to get that out of my speed picking. Um, but uh, I just love the smoothness of of uh, the the whole tapping the, and legato thing because it's not obtrusive. So so you have this you know marvelous run um, that's got a marvelous shape to because everything sort of shapes in my head. I don't know whether that makes sense to you. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, a lot of those runs, a lot of those passages passages make shapes in my head, um, and the tapping thing just allows you to get interesting shapes. Um, and I don't mean shapes like on the guitar. I mean uh, the fast passages form wave shapes in my head. <laughs> it's okay. really weird. Wow. Um, so so I, I when you say I wave, see... not like a sound wave. You mean like a no? Uh, it's hard to explain. If you can imagine like a sine wave, so so going up yep. and down very smoothly, up and down, and then up and over the top. You know that over the top thing. Um, you know that the top of the wave is a you know an important thing for me to have it sound really smooth and yeah, okay. and um, you know have and I'm I'm a stickler for, and Pete Drummond will tell you this. I'm a real stickler stickler for all the note values being even. Okay. So I worked a lot to a metronome and I still do because it drives me mad when you know people go well, listen out listen to this shredder and you just the note values are all over the show and you go yeah look. On the surface, it kind of sounds okay, but to me, this second half of the run was rushed, um, and then he started dragging here. So I just, I really just worked very hard on all the note yeah, values right. being exactly the same. And I know that's, you know, getting right down to the minutia of it, but that's I've always done that. I've always listened on that level. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but yeah, so the the that the multi finger tapping thing for me, you're right. It's an extension of of what I'm doing with my left hand, but it just allows you to hit some interesting harmonic content. Yeah, cool. And allows some the runs to to, to form some interesting shapes, mm-hmm. um, which may not make sense to anybody else, uh, but uh, it, it kind of does to me. So, um, it, it unlocks certain. Uh, it unlocks so the multi finger tapping thing, especially unlocks certain things that would just not be possible to play if you didn't use that technique. Yeah, right. So gotcha. So yeah, so it, it's just uh, it unlocks some some new harmonic content, if you will. Yeah, cool, man. I love it. Love it. That um that sleight of hand track I, I I mentioned. There's some really there's some great guitar tones on there. Like you talk about discovering tones as you've gone in your along yeah. like we all have, but um. Man, there's a really fat, thick, uh, screaming lead kind of sound, but there's some really, like towards the start of the track, there's some really cool stratty almost textures. a long time to get that man like everybody else probably got those tones way before i did um it took me a long time to find those tones because everything i did was so gain saturated (laughs) so and the country thing and this is why you know young guitar players 
you should not take the path that I took and just listen to one type of music for years. Um, because it wasn't until I opened my mind and listened to fusion and listened to country and you know, I could take all of those tones um, and sounds that I discovered and inject them into my own music. And all of a sudden you've got all of this, you know, um, you know, these cool new sounds to mess around with. Yeah. And I just love that single coil stratty kind of sound, which eluded me for years because uh-huh. it was like, I'm going to use guitars with humbuckers and play with as much gain as I possibly can. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so I'm glad that you picked up on that, man, because, uh, you know, it took me a long time to get to those, you know, those sort of crunchy tones. I really love them now, man. I really do. Yeah, oh, so cool. So cool. And then, but then, you know, you, you bring in other textures too, which is a lot of fun. Lots for the years to listen out for. What um, what are you playing these days? You mentioned the Godin deal well, was a while with, ago, but what are you doing now? I was with those guys for a long time, um, and you know, like, uh, and they're still around and they're doing their thing. But um, but like with so many uh, guitar companies, they're not really doing much sort of endorsement stuff at the moment. So yeah. So right now, I'm sitting here holding a uh, a Charvel SoCal. Oh yeah, nice. Um, um, and they, I've just fallen in love with the Charvel stuff, and I'm not really, I'm not working with those guys at the moment. I'm hoping to, um, but there's, there's no real kind of um, endorsement deals happening at the moment. That's sort of, it's all gone a bit weird um, with companies these days. So I'm, I'm hoping to do some work with Charvel, but I just, you know, I picked this one up, and, and I, and I really love it, you know. So they've got some, um, some really great features. I love the unfinished necks on them too, Matt. So. Yeah, nice. And um, as far as other gear, I. After being digital guy for many years, okay, you know everything from Zoom to Line Six to you name it. Uh, in January 2018, I went back to pedals. Uh huh. Um, which you know, I I went digital because you know the year 20 years ago, um, and I mean, and digital like was the first sort of I, I had rack mount stuff as well with the JMP one and the JFX one. Yeah, yeah. And then from there I went to, your, you know, your, your on-the-ground kind of, you know, your boss sort of guitar effects units and Zoom uh-huh. guitar effects units, and then that got into your, your more Line 6 EX FX type of thing. Yeah. Um, but um, at the beginning of last year, uh, and it's funny because it was it was from the country thing. It was from the whole country thing, and seeing that everybody had pedals, no one was digital in that world. Yeah, okay. Um, and oftentimes, I would show up to be at a festival, and I was the only guy using anything digital. And I just really loved some of the tones these guys were getting that you can get with the digital stuff, but they just didn't quite sound the same. There was a certain I can't even explain it. There was a certain organicness to their tones um, that I just wasn't getting. Um, using the digital sort of setup and you know it could just be my hands because you know how you know our own hands certainly behave in in certain ways with uh, various you know amps and pedals and um so yeah so i pretty much just went back to uh you know a, a pedals setup you know and it's really simple i've got a uh, you know a tuner that goes into a uh, mxr you know dyna compressor mm-hmm. which nice. has got two knobs on it um and I've got a, which goes into like a mini wah. And I know you've seen the mini cry babies. They're awesome. You stick them on your pedal board. They take yeah, up no yeah. space. Yeah. Um, and then um, I got a, uh, a, a pedal, which just, I, I absolutely love. And it pretty much lives on all the time. And um, it was a, a pedal by Horizon Devices, which is Misha Mansour from Periphery's company. It's called a Precision Drive. Okay. And they invented that thing really just to tighten up distortion sounds. and But the thing just by itself just gives this really wonderful all-purpose kind of crunchy, which does everything from blues to country. And it's got hardly any gain of its own, but it plays really nicely with other pedals. So I stack a um, – so I use that, and that pretty much lives on all the time because that gives you that mega strat tone that we were wow, just talking about. Cool. Awesome. Um, and that's what I recorded that sleight of hand song with. Um when I got that precision drive, but then, you know, I've got a, a Strymon Sunset, which for, for my money is the best kind of overdrive distortion pedal that I've heard yeah, for a wow, long time. Cool. Awesome. Um, and it does, it does everything from great country lead tones to screaming. It's got more gain on it than you can possibly imagine, Perfect. but um, it plays really nicely. So everything gets stacked on top of that precision drive. Yeah. Nice. Um, and, uh, and I've just recently, I have a friend here in Newcastle and he's a 26 year old kid and he's an electronics genius. 
Um, and his name is Sam Spencer. And this kid can build, he has a company called Simple Tone Audio and they do like uh, amazing guitar leads. Um, like, so there's Simple Tone and you're, you're about to see a, a, a announcement with that. So when I say I'm not endorsed with anybody, I've, I'm, I'm with Simple Tone now. Okay. We're about to announce that. And he just does these amazing guitar leads and, and um, you know, in whatever color you want, the cable is just ridiculous. It's shielded, you know, and, and they, they really do make a difference to your tone. And, but he has another company which he's not really doing much with last night, uh, like, like at the moment. Um, he sent me a text about last night about a pedal that he's building at the moment. But he builds pedals and he can build whatever you want. And so he's got this thing called a spam drive. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've got that on my board at the moment. And it's um, it's really you – know, there's a couple of unique things about it, which you know I don't even understand when he talks to me about it. But um, – <laughs> And it's again, it's just a really great all-purpose kind of lead sound, and it's got enough support to do all of the multi-finger tapping stuff, but it stays really clean. Um, and then, man, on the other side of that, I got a couple of delays, and and that's it, man. I got eight pedals, and that pretty much does everything I need it from from metal to fusion to to country. Nice, you know? man. So, that's very cool. So it's just really simple, and you yeah. know, like when you when you're working, you just need to. Uh, zip something up in a bag yeah. and and throw it on a plane and and you know when you get off the other end you, you know you hope that there's like a fender hot rod or something that you know good pedal platform yeah um, okay yeah so and and you know and because i used those so many times on um festivals and stuff i actually went and got one so oh, i have okay. a yeah i have a hot rod deluxe that i use for most gigs and i know it's not very metal um laney just sent me to uh uh head quad sort of uh thing they sent me um a 20 watt lionheart and a 50 watt lion okay i'm just messing around with those yeah yeah They're cool amazing yeah so uh so i'm yet to sort of take them out and do big gigs but in the studio they've been um they've been incredible so some you know there might be some some work with laney on the horizon as well but i'm using their lionheart 50 watt at the moment yeah um, cool man and about to take it out for some gigs uh in the next couple of weeks so so just real, but real simple now, man. Like it's just all simplified and and um, you know, easy to carry. And yeah, know, we're 40, 47 years old now. We don't want anything too nuts. No. So we did the, you know, I, I did the rack thing, you know, back in the day with you know, like all of the rack compressors and rack distortion units and and MIDI foot switches and you know, now yeah. I have like eight pedals which will pretty much give me anything I need. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, you know, as long as you understand too that the the uh, the gain knob, so the volume knob on your guitar, sorry, the volume knob is like having six different gain pedals. Oh, man, 100%. So, yes. And so many guys miss that because, yeah. you know, the, the volume knob on your guitar doesn't really turn your volume down until you get down to about three. Yeah. yeah Before yeah. that, it just thins the gain out. Yeah. So so I find myself riding the, you know, well, oh, that gain's a little bit too thick rather than I've got to find another pedal. I'll just yeah. turn the volume of the guitar down a little yeah. bit and it just thins it out. So, yeah. You know, if you've got a, a you know a good pedal and a, and a half decent guitar, so yeah. so it's like having another you know five gain pedals on your board without actually having to hit anything. Yeah, absolutely. So it's so so it's just that I've just gone really simple, man, and yeah, it's working. Very cool. Very and it's cool. breathing. Yeah, which nice. Is, you know, you don't sometimes get with the with the digital stuff. Sure, interesting. I mean, I've always loved your tone. I mean, we we're joking at the start about um, uh, oh, with the RGX. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, maybe post that tone. The yeah. uh, the Sydney Guitar Show, like, you, you, what did you say? You bent two notes the whole gig. Oh so yeah, yeah, yeah. That that one, yeah. When you did, yeah. but I thought, oh yeah, it's a good tone. Yeah, I can hear the tone. Yeah, yeah. and then you well, it's back that on was the Zoom stuff. Yeah, right. That was Zoom stuff back because that was part of the whole dynamic music thing. Okay. okay. Um, you know, and the, so I was using like a Zoom G two thing. So it just goes to show that you know if it's your hands. If yeah. you find what works with your hands, you can yeah. kind of make anything sound good. Yeah. But that's cool. Um, Again, if you've sort of come full circle of the pedals and it's working for you and it's helping you pull stuff. Are you a, are you a pedals thing? guy or are you a digital guy? I am a pedals guy. I had a little rack in the 90s like everyone. Mm. Yeah. Um, it was funny. Like, I don't know if I was the only one, but I just noticed I had to take my rack to gigs and, and every every couple of months I think there will be another pedal that I'd be lugging as well. <laughs> yeah. And after a while, I thought, hang on. Hang on. <laughs> yeah. These, these pedals are back. So, yeah, I've, I've been back on the pedals for a while. 
So yeah. It's, I think I feel like I did that slow. I feel like I did that slower than everybody else, but um, I'm glad I did it because yeah. it's um, there's a there's a you know organicness about the sound now that's really nice. That's cool, man. Man, so. awesome. I, I, just, I just need to ask you one more subject yeah. if I can, but yep. man, it's been Let's so fun catching up, man. It's been excellent. it has, yeah, man. It's been great fun. Um, you've been doing lots of guest spots on other records, and I've had the the privilege yeah. to hear a couple of things as well. Um, some of the stuff you post on your your social media, which which is always yep. fun. You you keep some good stuff on there, which is really great. Um, but yeah, tell tell me about the fractured dimension. So, thing. well, there's a couple that that I should talk about. Yep. Um, the fractured dimension is uh, the brainchild of a keyboardist from Springfield, Missouri. Yes, Springfield where mm-hmm. the Simpsons live. No, um, he's from Springfield in Missouri <laughs> and and he's got a little band of freaks. Um, there's a guy called Jerry Twyford that always plays uh, bass on um, on that stuff and, and, Jimmy and, and Jimmy and Jerry are just animals. These guys, like composers and players and, and Jimmy plays with a lot of, you know, different – he's played with, um, you know, Trans-Siberian Orchestra guys wow. and, and um, he plays in a bunch of metal bands. Um, but he he puts this thing together and uses musicians from all over the world um, called the Fractured Dimension. And I've done two Fractured Dimension records now, um, one with Marco Miniman on drums and one, the last one we did, uh, sorry, that was that was called Galaxy Mechanics. The name just came to me. So the one with Marco Miniman on drums was called Galaxy Mechanics and the one that we've just done um, on the precipice of many infinities um, so you can tell by the the names that it's extremely prog. It's kind of like Frank Zappa <laughs> meets meets you know death metal. Awesome, and um, <laughs> and it's incredibly complex music that you just get no warning about. Jimmy will email me and say, "Hey, play on this," and he'll send me like this you know uh, ridiculous tune. And the last one we did was called Mathematics of Divinity, and uh, I posted the three solos. Um, on my Facebook page. So if anybody listening wants to go and hit me up and friend yeah, me, awesome. you can see the, the three solos that I did on that, Which and it's some of the most difficult music that you ever would hope to play um, because these guys just, they have absolutely no, there's no mercy. There's no, well, well <laughs> let's just tone that down because it might be a bit much for people. There's none of that kind of men- mentality. It's just like, okay, let's go rhythmically weird. Let's go harmonically weird. And let's just, you know, throw out insane challenges to these guys. And um, so I play on that track. Um, Hannes Grossman, who's a death metal drummer from Germany, who's just an animal. He plays drums on that. Jerry plays bass. Jimmy, Jimmy is on keys. I do three guitar solos and all the melodies um, on that song. And he didn't send me a chart for them. It's all these really complicated. <laughs> and he's just like, it just worked out. <laughs> um, I'm like, yeah, do you want to tell me what key it's in? Um, so, so, uh, so we did that, um, you know, and it's, it's always one of those things where I have to live with that stuff for a sec, you know, cause I get it and I fly it into the studio and I look at it and I go, okay, I think he's finally beaten me. I have no idea what to play on this. Um, (laughs) and then so, so everywhere I go, you know, I get in the car and I play it and, and then little ideas start to form. Um, and you know, eventually you, 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 you know, pressing record going okay i've got an idea how to you know of how to solo over this and you go i can't believe i got here um but it's incredibly rewarding that sort of music you know and it might not be for everybody um but you know if you go and check out my three solos on that just know that there was a point that i was just sitting there looking at the 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 waveform of the track on my studio going i have no idea (laughs) what i'm gonna do over this um but when you start to push yourself and you push yourself mentally and, and, and physically uh-huh. and you start thinking, man, I can do this. I've got an idea for this. And then it starts working and happy days. Um, but, but one of the most exciting things that I'm doing at the moment, um, um, which I know he won't mind me talking about, um, is I'm actually I'm playing on Thomas Lang's record. Wow. Thomas Lang is, uh, if, you go, if you guys don't know, listening is uh, probably the scariest drummer on the planet, um, along with Pete Drummond. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but Thomas is just an animal and, you know, ridiculously popular and, and, you know, does all this crazy drum stuff. And he's doing a prog pop record. So, yes, it's progressive pop. Um, wow. So, so I've just done two tracks for that record and he sent me 
the first session he sent me, Matt, was 52 tracks. Um, <laughs> 25 of those were drums and, and, and about 14 of them were program keyboards. Oh, and he man. said, uh, I want all those keyboard parts replaced with guitars. <laughs> so, so when I finished that track, yeah. I sent him back uh, 44 tracks of oh, guitar. Oh, man. So, That's so cool. yeah, so it was, it was crazy. And, you know, there's, so there were some pretty cool opportunities to solo on that. But one of yeah. the things he wanted was he wanted me to double his kick pattern in the chorus of a song called I Don't Know You um, with a clean sound. Um, and so, so I had to play a note uh, at the turnaround of, of, um, of like every bar. So his kick pattern was like, like that. And I'm playing this, like that with a clean sound. Wow. Um, and it's like something like 30 second notes at 120 beats per minute, you know. So so he, he sets some great challenges. He's like, yeah, if you could just double my kick pattern with a clean sound. <laughs> You know, it's one yeah, thing it's to killer. do that stuff with uh, with overdrive, but yeah, you know, it's yeah. a whole other thing to actually turn all that off and go. <laughs> you know, I'm going to do this with a clean sound. So that comes out later in the year, and there's some um, some cool. pretty cool people working on that. You know, like I, the the um, bass player for for Thin Lizzy and uh, and Evanescence um, actually plays and sings on that track. Oh wow! So awesome. so it's a really good kind of introduction, and you know, we're sort of maybe hinting at doing some touring with that. Oh, um, wow. later in the year uh, in other countries. So, so yeah, so the Thomas Lang thing is the, the last thing that I've worked on, so, and that's been a lot of fun. Um, and then, you know, hopefully a collaboration between myself and my uh, my brother in musical insanity, Pete Drummond, will, will hopefully be out this year as well. Yeah, cool. But just keeping up with the stuff that that guy writes. Um, <laughs> as a, you know, as a pleb guitar player, you know, we don't understand rhythm the same way that those guys do, and especially freaks like Pete. You know, who can send you a track and you go, and he's playing on it is so complex, but so musical. But you, you know, I ring him and I go, what time signature is that in? Like, it's not seven. It's not, he goes, oh, it's four. <laughs> <laughs> you go, okay. <laughs> Didn't pick that. Um, oh, so man. that's, you know, so it's one of those things when I know it's, it's, I have my work cut out for me whenever I play with that guy because rhythmically he's just terrifying. Um, so, so, but we'll have something out. Hopefully, uh, we've actually written a number of tunes and started recording it. So, so there'll be uh, that. That's one of the things I'm looking forward to putting out as well. So, for for drummers and guitar players alike. Yeah, cool, so, man. Fantastic. So, yeah, that's me right now, brother. That's awesome, man, Jeremy. Thank you so much. It's been so fun to, dude. Thanks for having me to hook up and do this thing, man. Yeah, man. Awesome. Let's uh, try and stand in the same room together. That's the next step. At some, at some point. That's and talk. Some, yeah. So, <laughs> so awesome, brother. Thank you so much. All right, there you go. My conversation with Jeremy Barnes. That was very cool. That was a lot of fun. Man, that was like meeting up with an old friend, except we haven't actually met yet. So that was, that was awesome. Please check out Jeremy's stuff. And uh, I'm really looking forward to some of the new stuff he's working on at the moment too. Almost time for me to go. Um, remember to head over to guitarspeakpodcast.com to check out our social media links, uh, where to subscribe to the podcast, how to buy a t-shirt, all that stuff. Okay, my name's Matt Wakeling. Thank you so much for joining me. I'll catch you next time. Bye now. Oh, P.S. Stick around for an outtake from the interview. Okay, I'm really going now. See ya. Hello. Hello. We look like we're on FaceTime audio. Is that better? Yeah, yeah. That sounds good. It does. It actually is better. It's pretty amazing. Far out. That's sound. That's amazing. That's just so much clearer. Yeah, it's killer. There's more tops in it. There's more top ends. <laughs> <laughs> tone, man. It's it's tone. It's all about tone. Yeah, it's, it's tone. It's got a better tone. Our phone call's got a better tone. <laughs> oh, that's good. Oh, no, but it feels cool. like you've put it. Put some compressor on it, mate.